Okay, uh, so my name's um, Turner from EPCC up here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and one of the things I've been working on a lot over the past uh, year or so is benchmarking various HPC systems uh, that are available to researchers around the UK. Uh, but in particular, rather than just uh, doing a traditional benchmarking approach, I wanted to try and do something a bit different around open source benchmarking, just at least partially because a lot of the problems that I've seen with benchmarking are to do with not enough data being available or not, not having the data available to be as comparable to things properly. So what I'm going to do today is talk mostly about um, the approach we've taken to doing this benchmarking um, and not really show very many results. You can go and explore the results yourself in, in the repository link I'll show you uh, later. But we'll talk about the approach, why we've taken it, and what the benefits have been and where um, potentially we're going next with this. Okay. Um, feel free to interrupt me with questions, and you'll probably have to speak rather than using the chat window, as I can't see the chat window and do the presentation um, at the same time. So, or you can just wait till the end, and I'm happy to uh, take questions there. That may be easier in some senses for this presentation anyway. So, on my first slide, um, actually, all of this slide material itself is Creative Commons. If you want a copy of it, we'll put a link up to uh, the slides after the presentation, along with uh, the recording. The other thing I should note is this uh, presentation is being recorded, um, so we can put it up on the website um, afterwards. Um, so if you miss any of it or you want to look at it again, then you should be able to see it at the, web the website in a few days' time. Okay, so what am I actually going to talk about? Well, my structure is why I'm going to give an introduction to what we've been doing, talk a bit about the open source benchmarking, a very quick um, look at benchmarking results. Um, and actually, the last two, I'll probably do the other way around. I'll have to talk about the next steps and then take any questions. And if there's time at the end, I'll also um, give people a bit of a live demo and show them what the repository looks like and what the material looks like. Um, the link below actually gives the is give you, will give you access to a uh, repository that contains all the uh, benchmarking results. Um, the, the actual repository is called the Archer Benchmarks because that's uh, where the effort was funded from, where a lot of the effort came from um, to start off this thing, start off this activity. But uh, the work we've been doing has actually been wider than just covering Archer, which is the UK National Supercomputing Service. So um, it's covered a lot of the tier two service as well and some um, Dirac systems. Okay, so why uh, you know why were we interested in this? Why did we get involved in this um, activity in the first place? Why are we interested? So the main reason is why now? Well, there were lots of different HPC systems we were coming to UK researchers as well as Archer, um, the the UK National Supercomputing Service. There was the um, Dirac facilities, which had just had a refresh to Dirac two point five. Um, for astronomy and part particle physics. Um, there are the national tier two services, which were funded by EPSRC, which are distributed across the country. So there's one here in Edinburgh, and there are also systems um, out of the University of Cambridge, Oxford, um, the Midlands Consortium, and a consortium down in the southwest of England called GW4 as well. Um, so that, and there's also the PRACE facilities or Pan European facilities. So with all these um, different things, including commercial cloud providers, there is a large amount of choice around um, HPC systems available to UK researchers. Um, and apart from the complexity of, of um, finding out how to apply and get access to all these things, which I'm not really going to cover very much in this talk, uh, there's always the challenge about which one is right for my research. And so one of the key motivations was um, to allow people to choose if not the best, or to know which, which systems will be most appropriate for their research and make some inform, more informed choices about which ones fit the best or which types of applications. Um, so these, are, these different services have also covered quite a wide variety of um, different architectures from standard Intel Xeon CPUs, um, NVIDIA GPUs, ARM64 CPUs, and soon, I guess, in, uh, coming up, although we didn't have any available for the benchmarking yet, AMD, the new AMD Epic. Um, CPUs as well. And all of these systems cover a variety of different interconnects, 
for example, Intel UPA, Cray Aries, and Mel different, very, different um, generations of Mellanox technology, and different IO um, subsystems from things like Lusker and um, Spectrum Scale, which was for, used to be known as GPFS. Uh, so there's a wide range of different stuff available and not a huge amount of information on how it performs for yeah, user applications, at least um, covering the diversity of systems anyway. So what we were aiming at was to talk to researchers, the people who use the systems, users, to give you, them some information required to choose the right service for their research. But we also had wanted to give the service staff, the people who run the services, some more information to help understand their service performance and help plan maybe future procurements or understand where the differences lie between different technologies. Um, and in our case, we're really interested in um, application performance, mostly rather than um, characteristics, the hardware and the performance of synthetic benchmarks. So most of the benchmarks we've run have been in testing full software packages that people use in real life, things like um, Castep and Gromax, and we want to use realistic use cases. So rather than choosing something very synthetic, using something that actually, although maybe not exactly what the researchers would run themselves, but it models well um, the types of things that a researcher would use on the systems. So our initial approach um, has been to use the software in the same way as a researcher would. Okay, so Although this is a benchmarking exercise, we haven't approached it from a very um, sort of rigorous and um, theoretical pure approach. We wanted to use the software in the same way as we said, and that means sometimes we use the already installed versions of the software, they're already installed on the platform. So if we log onto a system and it's already got a version of Gromax installed, then happily use that because that's what any user coming onto that system would use in itself. Um, what that does mean, is that sometimes there'll be a bit of variation between the different versions of the software used on different platforms because they might have slightly different versions of the software, maybe compilers and things like that. So this isn't a pure benchmarking comparison of like for like in terms of software, but it is a comparison of um, environment to environment or system to system as presented to the user. And um, if they're not available, then we'll compile it sensibly for performance and um, use do what um, you might do, but we won't extensively optimize it and spend a long time optimizing the code. We'll take how the code recommends you compile it and use it in that way without going much further than that, because that's, again, is what a user would do themselves, okay, in general, rather than going to a lot of effort to tune lots of different flags. Um, as I said, we might use different versions of software on different platforms, but we'll always try and use the latest version available on that platform with the assumption that the latest version is the one that um, researchers often want to use because it's got the function the functionality required or it's got better performance and so on and so forth. Um, we have run some synthetic benchmarks particularly to test IO performance because it would be quite difficult um, to do that or it's more difficult to do that of applications and it's definitely more difficult to understand IO performance from applications than it is from synthetic benchmarks. But where we've chosen these synthetic benchmarks, we tried to choose ones that model um, user application behavior rather than anything else. So instead of using something like IOR, which has a very particular model of doing parallel IO, which doesn't really map very well onto what um, a user might do, having something that writes out um, data that's distributed on a, a grid in, in, a, in, a different, in, in a similar way to a grid-based code. That a user might use and would do, would do. Okay, so our approach maybe suffers from the criticism of being not very pure and not comparing like from like, but that isn't what we're aiming for here. We're aiming for comparing um, the performance people actually, users actually get on a system, and that means taking the system as is a lot more than you might do if you're taking the pure benchmarking approach. Okay, so that's all quite sort of normal, traditional uh, benchmarking. But what's the open source um, part of this benchmarking? Why are we call, called this, or why have I called this open source benchmarking in some sense compared to um, what people have done before? So 
what I mean by open source is we try to make everything available publicly. So rather than just publishing or making available the results of the benchmarking, as in plots or um, tables of data, we provide the full output data from the benchmark runs um, freely available to everybody. Okay, full information on how we've compiled, if we've done that, and remember we use the so with the codes already installed if possible, make sure that that's freely available to everybody as well. Um, we also make it available the job scripts we used, so there are no hidden tricks or variables. You can easy, see exactly what we ran on the system um, and understand how we did it. And make, um, as far as possible, input data for the benchmarks freely available. In fact, we make all the input data available because we've only chosen benchmarks that are um, available in the um, in the public domain and um, for that reason so we can so that people can take it and run it themselves and the what perhaps quite only we make source for all our analysis programs or scripts freely available but actually most of these are analysis how we turn um, the information from the output data from the benchmark runs into the actual performance data we report uh, most of these are available are uh, done in the form of ipython notebooks and we make the source for these all available in the repository so you can see how we've produced um, the numbers we've produced. The idea being that you can trace from how we ran the benchmark all the way through to how we've produced the results that we've presented and understand what we've done and point out where we've gone wrong. Okay. So why have we done, done it in this way? Well, the, the reason we took this approach were, was because there are various problems with benchmarking studies that I've used before. I mean, I've been working with benchmarking quite a long now, but quite a long time now, and it's incredibly frustrating. Oh, I found it very frustrating, right? So benchmarking really is a process of quantitative comparison of data from different systems or different programs or different architectures. But most of the benchmarkings you see, benchmarking studies you see published or the data made available don't really lend themselves to this actual quantitative comparison. Right? They don't publish the raw results, only the process data. So you've no I often no idea exactly how they ran the benchmark or how they produced the data um, from the benchmark. So they don't publish the details of how the data was processed in sufficient detail. So you can run potentially, if you can get hold of the same benchmark, the same benchmark as the person, but you might see a performance difference, but then you don't understand if that performance difference is because you're analyzing the data in a different way from them, that there was some extra command line variable or module command put in their job script that you have no visibility of, things like that. So we wanted to try and um, avoid these pitfalls um, not providing, so quite often you get benchmarks, we ran the benchmark X, Y, Z, and there's no input data sets provided. So you'll spend some time searching around on the web to see, try and identify which uh, input data set they've used, you find a likely candidate, you think it might be the right one, but because they haven't provided the details, you're not 100% sure. And as I said, without the job submission scripts, you can't tell if there's some sort of magic flag or magic module being loaded um, that makes a difference uh, to how the benchmark runs. And they don't provide, often, though this is changing a bit more, is they don't provide details of how the software is compiled on the different, on each of the platforms, which means that you're not quite sure of the different, if you see a difference in performance, whether it's coming from um, your comp from your compilation options or from um, a real difference in the system itself. Okay, so we've taken a different approach and we think the benefits of this are where it allows a proper comparison with other studies. Okay, all our data is there, everything's available. If you don't trust what we've done or you think there's something, the analysis we've done is a bit wrong or you want to compare to something else, then you can do it much more easily and with much more confidence than you would in it with a traditional study. The data can be used in different ways by different other people. So we can publish this data. We've done some analysis ourselves of the data and publish things that we think are interesting and useful, but other people might find other things interesting or useful. With all the data there, then you can take our um, data we've produced, analyze it in different ways to um, look at different aspects of performance or things that you might be interested in. It's easier to share and collaborate with others. I have to say that although um, it's always great to collaborate, this wasn't one of our driving factors when we in, in, initiated this approach. But actually having everything in a public GitHub repository has proven incredibly useful for um, collaborating with other people because 
rather than emailing documents around or emailing results backwards and forwards or saying try this try that we can just point to the thing on the web and say here's what we did um here's the input data you can get it from here here's the analysis we did um, and it shows people exactly what you've done in a very easy way without having to compose emails that might be um misinterpreted or um have mistakes in them you know the mistakes are spotable and reproducible because we've got the thing so that's actually proved a huge benefit that we didn't anticipate um, at the start of this process um, and verification and checking right other people can check your approach and analysis right so i so often when you do benchmark benchmark is often done by people who are really very competent which is great and everybody um, tries their hard generally to get the right results and to be um, consistent and honest and do it in the right way but people make mistakes okay and having everything open and out there means that other people can spot your mistakes and help you improve uh, the work you've been doing actually if you if we look at if you look at the repository now there's a couple of issues raised um by um a, some uh, somebody had spotted a mistake we made and we're working to um resolve them at the moment and that's just great i it's brilliant that somebody has been able to look at the thing and say oh what you did there i think that's the wrong thing and then you can have a discussion about it and say oh yeah i agree with that and then go forward and improve your analysis improve the quality of what you're doing because other people um, can see what you do without all the data and the analysis scripts being there that becomes much more difficult and you have to just um, take the results as you see them and, and hope that um, your interpretation of what you think people have done is right and um, rather than actually looking and seeing that it's right okay so i think by far I mean, this has been the real uh, win for this approach has been the fact that we can other people can check our data we can share it easily the data can be reused and it allows for comparison um, with other studies that's been really, they've all been really positive aspects of what we've done here so i don't have as i mentioned I don't, I'm not going to show many results in this talk, although we have, there are lots of results out there. Um, I'm just going to show a couple of things of the sort of ideas that we've done. We've done two, we've released two reports um, so far. Uh, one that looked at um, comparing the performance of different HPC systems that all used um, Intel Xeon CPUs of various generations. So this was a much more comparing like with like, you know, what was the impact of newer versions of Intel processors? Uh, on application performance and on the application scaling. And then we published a second report more recently looking at uh, comparing single node performance, and that spans different architectures. So that covers um, both Intel um, CPUs, ARM CPUs, and uh, GPU enabled nodes for those for the codes that have um, that capability, and looked at the difference in performance um, between different node architectures. So and so the sort of results you get um, from the comparison of the different Intel CPU CPUs is, are these sorts of plots. So this is um, the Castep benchmark, which is um, the standard aluminium AL slab benchmark off the Castep website. And um, the different systems are listed here with Archer, which is the oldest um, generation of CPUs we have in the study, the Intel um, Ivy Bridge Xeons, um, three different um, types of Broadwell processor, which are Cirrus, Athena, and Thomas, um, which are relatively recent, and the most recent Skylake Gold um, processors on the Petafor Skylake system, which is in uh, Cambridge. And you can see here, that sort of as expected, um, the Archer performance is the lowest because the older CPUs then. Next, after that, you have the Broadwell class of CPUs, and there's some difference in performance between the different um, models of processor of different core counts per node um, with the Skylake um, and the newest processor providing the best performance. Okay, um, so some of the performance difference here is due to uh, different core counts per node, whether you've got lower ones like Archer, which has 24 cores per node, and some of the um, Broadwells have 24 cores per node, um, and some of it's due to the newer processor architecture. Uh, this is discussed in more detail, I'll provide the links to the reports at the end. Um, at the end later on in the presentation and then for the uh, single node performance i've got some examples some results here for uh, gromax and this is for um a um 
benchmark that came from HE, the high-end consortium for bioelectric simulation, which are one of the large consortia that run on Archer um, in this area. And again, you can see what we've got here. We've got um, Archer um, and Cirrus and Petafor Skylake from the, which are the same systems as from the previous study with the um, Archer with the Ivy Bridge, Cirrus with Broadwell, and uh, Petafor Skylake with the uh, Skylake Gold processor. But we've added in some other ones here as well. So there's Tesseract, which is one of the um, Dirac systems, uh, has uh, Xeon Skylake Silver. There's Isambard, which has the ARM processors, the uh, what that used to be Cavium Thunder X2, and then now um, Marvell Thunder X2, the name of the processor manufacturer changed. And then the, the system in Cambridge, which is the GPU enabled one. And we can see the different uh, performance of Chromax in terms of nanoseconds per day. Here again, as the processor generation increases, you generally see an improvement and increase in performance, though there are some differences with uh, the Skylake Silver um, performance being closer to Archer, which is the Ivy Bridge. Um, and similarly for the um, ARM processor, and the GPU, as expected, has higher performance because it's got the GPUs and Gromax can take good advantage of them, but actually not that much higher than just using the Skylake Gold CPUs um, themselves here. And again, there's a full report comparing single node performance across different systems uh, available uh, on the web for free. So I just want to say a quick bit, that those are the results, and I've talked about the open source benchmarking, Give you an idea of what we're doing next um, and then probably we'll have a chance for people to ask some questions and then if people want we can have a look at the uh, repository itself and have a walk through and i can show you what's uh, available there so oh so write a report on single mode performance comparisons which has just uh, re recently been, been completed in the last couple of months and that's gone up there um, we've got to run the multi-node arm processor tests as soon as the systems are available so the um ARM processor systems have been available for the last few months, so we're still we're in the process of doing that. There are some results out there from the GW4. They recently presented multi-node results at um, the Cray User Group Conference in Montreal, which was earlier this month, and there's some results being presented from the UK Catalyst System systems, which are the ARM system, which are also ARM systems coming at um, conferences over the next few months. Um, what we, one other thing we try like to try and do is run these benchmarks on commercial cloud offerings to look at the state of HPC in uh, the commercial cloud, such as AWS or Azure or the, um, the Google Cloud, and to see how well they perform compared to this traditional on-premises um, HPC offerings. Um, look at including some machine learning, uh, deep learning benchmarks in the set. We're actually working on this at the moment. Uh, so we're evaluating different uh, potential benchmarks for different machine learning frameworks uh, to try and understand their performance as that becomes more and more important to people running on HPC systems. Um, and do some performance analysis. So at the moment, what we've done is run the benchmarks and measured the performance and then done some analysis based on that. Actually, what also what we'd like to do is run um, Different performance analysis, use different performance analysis frameworks to take a deeper look at how they, um, how the different codes benchmarks perform on different platforms, and match this up to the um, analysis we've been doing from a higher level. So have a bit of a lo lower level look, um, to try and to try and validate what we've done already, um, and provide a bit more understanding of where the benchmark performance differences come from. Um, and that's the link to the repository uh, with the benchmarks in again. One thing I should mention um, before we get to the end is there's a website called HPC UK, which um, we've developed in collaboration with um, Christopher Woods, the University of Bristol, who's part of the uh, UK RSE, Research Software Engineering Group, to try and give people an idea of what systems are available to UK researchers and how you might go about applying for them. So actually this website really is a collection of links, but it's a it's a collection of links to try and bring together all the different UK HPC systems that are available to people um, across the UK in terms of anybody from any institution can apply to that, uh, to for access to that uh, system so that people can find it out. It's actually an open source community developed website. So if you see something wrong or you want something added to it, then you can um, actually do that yourself or send in um, what you want to be done 
and we can look at doing adding that in as well. Um, so my final slide is just a summary of the uh, two reports we've done based on this so far. One was the uh, multi-node stuff preparing um, the different Intel processor generations, like myself and Jeffrey, um, were the major contributors to that. And then we've looked at the single node uh, performance as well, um, which was myself and that was just re released recently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop, give people a chance to ask any questions. Um, and then um, if people are still interested, we can take a quick look um, at the repository itself um, and see. And, yeah, and people can ask questions about that too. Okay, so thank you everybody for listening. Um, let me know if you want to ask anything. Fine, please do a tour of the project. Right, okay, I'll do that and uh, we'll see how we go with that. Let me look at sharing this. So, so I had a link to the repository just back here. So let's get that to. Okay, so the top level of the repository um, just gives an idea of what we're doing. It has links um, to the two reports. So if we look at the single node performance report, again, this is part of the repository itself. So, and describes a bit about the different systems we've benchmarked um, in terms of the technical details, um, some details of the processors and their performance. Um, trying to understand, one of the things we wanted to do with the uh, single node performance benchmarking was have a look at how we can tie, how well we can tie the, perform the observed performance to different hardware um, capabilities. So for example, one of the things you could tie it to is um, in terms of um, the node uh, single precision performance, the compute performance of a node, or also um, the memory bandwidth performance of a node. So we used uh, the stream benchmark of the HPC challenge suite to measure the node memory performance and then use that uh, to try and analyze the performance of the different benchmarks. And then, so then we run the benchmarks, got different performance, we got some details of the comp compilation there, um, got out the different performance, and then done correlation analyses to things like floating point performance and memory bandwidth and talk about how uh, strongly correlated uh, different things, the different parts are. Okay. And finally, finishing up with um, some conclusions about the different applications and what that means uh, for users and maybe some advice for, for them on which, um, which systems to choose. One of the interesting things here is when we did the correlation analysis, um, what the, somebody noticed that um, potentially we've uh, missed uh, doing correlation to do with um, different frequency drops, depending on whether you use AVX2, AVX512 instructions, and also um, how we use memory bandwidth um, to do the correlation analysis. So we're working with those to try and improve things. So can so Zeng, Zeng Zong's can can these HPC benchmarks be run directly on ARM clusters? Um, so yes. So almost all of them, um, in fact, all the ones we've tried have run without problem on the ARM clusters. We haven't done much about um, the I/O benchmarks on the ARM systems yet, because the Catalyst system that we've mainly been working on doesn't have a parallel file system set up properly yet, but the uh, Isambard system, which is in down in the uh, GW4 consortium, does have a luster file system. So those things will be able to be tested now, but we haven't actually had a chance to do that. Yet. Okay, so I mean, one of the things about the art that's been interesting about ARM systems, or maybe not interesting, but surprisingly easy, has been porting applications to them. Um, we haven't really seen much trouble at all in porting. Um, applications to the ARM systems, where maybe you would have thought it would be more difficult um, than that going forward. Um, so if you spot something um, that you don't agree with, or you have an idea for how this can be proved, you can just raise an issue in the repository, and we do actually respond and try to do something about it. So let's go back um, to the top 
level and have a look at um, how we've been analyzing uh, the data. So if we look in um, the analysis folder, there's a um, an example of how we've computed the signal mode uh, performance and the details of how we've done that, uh, all contained within uh, the Jupyter notebook um, hosted in the repository. So what you can see is rather than just say, oh, here's the results we've got, which is um, which were in the paper or were in the report, I just show you this is the, how we got to those results. So how we extracted the um, peak floating point performance from the different systems. Um, and the peak memory performance from the systems, and then how we extract the performance results for the different um, platforms, for the different benchmarks, and the analysis of that, and how then how we correlate that to peak floating point performance and correlate that to memory performance as well. And then performance comparisons using each different uh, performance comparison matrix looking at each different system. As the base, as as the baseline, and comparing what the difference is performance, and that's repeated for all the different benchmarks. So actually, you can go and spot where we've made the stupid mistake in analysing our data and point that out, point that out to us, or you can use this as the basis of your own, um, and or you can use use this as the basis for your own analysis of the data, or running the benchmarks on another system that you've got access to, and reusing the analysis to see how it ties in um, to the to what we the results we got as well okay and actually this has been really useful as i've said because we've been able to say when somebody says oh how did you get that number you can just actually point them at this url and they can go and look for themselves about how um, how we managed to do that and potentially what we've done what we've got wrong and what we've got right um, other than that so we have information on the different benchmarks we've run you can see here there's a few synthetic benchmarks HPC Challenge, which we've used um, to look at um, things like um, Stream, which I already mentioned, which is a synthetic memory mem mem measure of memory performance. But also, um, there's a latency bandwidth uh, benchmark in there that looks at some uh, fundamental properties of the uh, interconnect. Uh, BenchIO, which is a um, IO benchmark that tries to model how a user would actually do Parallel I.O. better than something like I.O.R. Um, and MD test, which is a quite a synthetic test of um, the metadata server performance on Parallel file systems, which actually is more of a bottleneck for most I.O. performance of a lot of things on um, HPC systems than um, the I.O. bandwidth. And then we have application benchmarks. Um, so we've seen the cast results, and we have various cast results. For CASTEP, we have two different benchmarks, a small one, which you've seen the results for already, which is the AL Slab benchmark from the CASTEP website, and a large one also from the CASTEP website, which is a DNA uh, benchmark. And that's more to look at the scaling of CASTEP um, and is quite large and doesn't work on all the systems because some systems don't have the, uh, the required amount of memory or number of nodes to be able to run that benchmark. And then we have um, build instructions for the different platforms, um, analysis of the different results and um, output from the uh, different benchmark runs. So you can see here, there's a folder with the results from all the different um, systems in. And that's repeated for um, all of the benchmarks, apart from the meta for Unified Model 1, which we haven't quite got up and running yet. And then the technical details of all the systems benchmarks are, all, are contained within a, a YAML file, so we can use them programmatically in our analysis as well okay um but again this repository is there people are free to cloak free to fork it and um, issue prs for corrections or adding data or doing new analysis or things like that all free to just take the data and use it in, in any way they want um, going forward it's uh yeah it's good it's gpl free license so you can just take the data and use it as you wish um, does that give you enough of an idea about how we're doing things and how it's all fitting together? So which of the test packages require a license? So um, originally, the only one 
the only two that require the license out of the cap. And so all of the um, synthetic benchmarks are just publicly open source available. The only one, the only two out of the um, application benchmarks that weren't open source licensed were the Met Office Unified Model and Caster. So um, Met Office Unified Model is still licensed software, uh, but as I said, we don't really have the results for that one yet. Um, anyway, that one pro proves more problematic to port to different platforms than any of the others, so it's been difficult. Um, but Caster is um, freely available for all academics, I think, worldwide now. I think they recently changed their licensing structure. It used to be freely available for UK academics, and then it was freely available for European academics. I think the most recent um, license agreement means the um, CASTA source is freely available for all um, worldwide academics. <coughs> so I think that in, in practice, that's the only one we have given that we've not been able to run the Met Office benchmark across multiple platforms, that's the only one that really has any sort of restrictive licensing. Um, I should say that uh, there are plans to add um, some more benchmarks here. I talked about the machine learning one, which we're looking at at the moment. The other thing we're going to add is another synthetic benchmark based on the Intel MPI benchmarks to give a better idea of MPI performance across the or what the sort of limits of MPI performance across the different systems and interconnects. Um, and we're also, um, we had some initial chats with the DIRAC people about getting some astro and particle physics benchmarks um, into the set as well, because these ones originally came out of the Archer community, which means they're quite focused on the um, EPSRC NERC side of things. Um, we're speaking to, uh, Chat to Lydia Heck and Peter Boyle at Dura. Yeah, so Adam, Adam says it might be interesting to part, populate nodes to tease apart some of the issues, such as memory bandwidth for core and things like that. Um, that's certainly true. Um, most of the things, I mean, there's, there's a huge number of things we'd like to do, um, but as always, time is a more of a constraint than you would like it to be um, on what's possible and what you have time to do and what you don't have time to do. So yes, I mean, certainly underpopulating can give you, um, can actually reveal quite a lot of information. We had, did have some problems on the ARM systems, which aren't published, which aren't available yet, um, but which hopefully will be soon, uh, where we'd seen some issues with um, MPI collective performance. And we wondered if that was to do with congestion coming off the node, because one of the things about the ARM processors is it has a lot more cores per node than um, the Xeons. Um, but the network interface is pretty similar. So we did wonder if congestion was causing the issues when we were doing um, large um, collective calls, particularly all to walls or to all these uh, as cast set users. Um, but that doesn't really seem to have been the issue. Um, and actually the, that issue has been resolved a bit recently because uh, we found different ways to compile the NPI libraries on the ARM processors to get around it. And the other thing, I guess, around memory bandwidth and those sort of things is one one thing. One thing that's quite hard sometimes, although we can do these, we've done this stuff with uh, single nodes and correlation analysis to hardware characteristics, and we can reveal trends, or at least give some indication of where the performance is coming from. And um, that's no substitute for actually doing proper profiling performance analysis. Um, so we'd like, although you can't do that for every you do on every platform, we'd at least like to do a few representative ones with full profile analysis to, under, to either verify or contradict what we're asserting from the uh, correlation analysis. To have a time scale when the had gen benchmarks would be available. So as I mentioned, they're more difficult as well because of licensing. So it's difficult to make them um, publicly available. Right? And as I said as well, it's been a a real pain porting them to different systems. So do I have a time scale? The short answer is no. Um, in fact, we do are considering um, taking a more open source uh, Earth system model and using that and using benchmark from that instead of using the, uh, the Met Office uh, route, the Met Office Nemo route, uh, because that, well, 
hopefully it'd be easier to port, but also because it'd be open source, it'd be easier to make it available um, to more generally. But actually, what has happened is we've got, had so much work to do on the stuff we do have that we haven't focused very much on that, uh, on that side of things at the moment. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any more questions or comments? No? Well, I, if you think of anything afterwards, I mean, my email was on the slides, um, just a.turner at ebcc. Um, feel free to contact me directly with any questions you have, or feel free to put, issue, put issues up on the repository as well, and we can respond to them there um, too. But we have access to any Cascade Lake systems in the near future. So the answer is yes. Uh, so um, we recently were working with um, Loughborough University who are getting a Cascade Lake system um, very quite shortly. Um, and they were keen for us to take these benchmarks and help them shake down the system by running the benchmarks on their system. And it has the benefits of getting the Cascade Lake performance as well. So that'll be interesting too. So I don't quite have a time scale on that. It depends a bit on the installation timelines because they're giving us time to do this out of the kindness of their hearts. So but hopefully later in the summer, uh, on the sort of July, August timeframe, we should be able to put, add those results to a repository. Okay, as I was saying, feel free to contact me, ask questions. Um, this session has been recorded, so um, it will go up on the Archer website, hopefully in a few days. And thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time to come along and listen. I hope you find it interesting. <laughs>